Welcome to Quest for Quest. I'm your host, Adam. My initial plan for this series of videos was to review and rate each episode of the real adventures of Johnny Quest chronologically. Unfortunately, due to a severe lack of time caused by problems in both personal and professional life, I wasn't able to keep up with my schedule and release one video every two weeks as I wanted. I still plan to cover the show in its entirety sometime in the future, but for the time being, I've decided to shuffle the order of the episodes. This will allow me to focus on the most interesting episodes first. Hopefully, you will still join me on this journey. With this out of the way, onwards we go. Today I'm reviewing the ninth episode of the second season, titled DNA Doomsday. I will begin with a recap of the plot, followed by a discussion of some of the episode's highlights, and conclude with my overall thoughts and rating. In my personal opinion, the series worked best when it combined a solid mystery for the mind and emotional thrills for the heart. So when assigning a score, I primarily consider these two factors. DNA Doomsday is actually not one of those episodes of the real adventures of Johnny Quest that stuck with me for almost three decades to come. To be honest, I don't really remember watching it as a kid. However, this one really stood out to me when I did a complete rewatch of the show several years back. The reason for that being, I was completely surprised to find a cartoon for kids, one that aired on Cartoon Network of all places, that had been so clearly inspired by John Carpenter's The Thing, one of the scariest and goriest horror movies of all time. I mean, DNA Doomsday takes place in a locked military base on a remote island and features characters facing a shape-shifting monster. To me, that's the same level of cool as stand-ins for Hellraiser's Cenobites appearing in the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy and Extreme Ghostbusters. To be fair though, the show would often reference myths and legends, as well as pre-existing works of literature and cinema, so this wasn't a one-time affair. When you think about it, the script for DNA Doomsday could easily work as one of those The Thing from Another World comic books. It's just the contrast between John Carpenter's movie and this children's cartoon that I find so striking. Now, onto the plot summary. The episode is set entirely at a secure military base in the Solomon Islands in the Pacific Ocean. General Axton visits Dr. Carroll, who has developed a massive biological computer seen as a huge column of tissue inside water and glass. Yes, we will be reminded several times that the monster of this episode is not a shape-shifting alien but in fact a biological computer. I'm not fond of this creative decision to be honest, but I will expand on this issue later. Anyway, General Axton doesn't think the project's a good use of the army's money, and I like this character trait. You would expect him to be a stereotypical warmonger, whose sole focus is on militarizing anything in his sight. But no, Axton is more of a businessman who tries to keep his budget tight. Throughout the whole episode he will keep criticizing the project and never act like Ash in Ridley Scott's Alien. What was your special order? Bring back life form. Priority one. All other priorities rescinded. You still don't understand what you're dealing with, do you? Perfect organism. Dr. Carroll happens to be a friend of Dr. Quest, to whom he wants to present his biocomputer. Meanwhile, Team Quest sails from Hawaii. If you've seen my previous reviews of the show but haven't seen the show itself, you will notice that the main cast was redesigned and revoiced between the seasons to resemble the 60s series more. Thanks, Bandit, but I'm done. Time for a little R&R &R behind the wheel. It's my day off, you know. Now, don't you know you're not supposed to play with knives? Pa always told me that it's not polite to hit a lady, but then again, Miss Julia, you're no lady. Most of these changes weren't radical, but some characters, like the awesome Jeremiah Surd, got a rotten deal. Speaking of everything rotten, while en route, Johnny plays a quest world game in which he fights chess pieces one at a time with a sword. This sequence features a CGI dragon on a par with the infamous one from the Polish The Witcher series. Back at the laboratory, Dr. Carroll activates the biocomputing genome processor, but an explosion ensues due to sensory overload. Then, the biocomputer attacks Carroll and his assistant, seemingly killing them, along with two guards. Meanwhile, Johnny, Dr. Quest, Haji, and Race arrive. 
Axton drives them to the biocomputer laboratory. While boasting about his base, he mentions the storage of a live nuke and the creation of a prototype suboceanic missile launch silo. This info will come into play soon. The group arrives at the research laboratory and finds Carol and guards neurologically unresponsive, barely having pulses. Meanwhile, we see the creature shapeshift for the first time. It assaults a soldier and replicates Carol's eye and hand to gain access to an alpha-level part of the base. This is a pretty unsettling scene, but even scarier scenes are soon to follow. Meanwhile, Dr. Quest deduces that the DNA in the computer has become so highly energized that it drains the power of what it touches, including human tissue. So in a way, it's like an energetic vampire. My name is Colin Robinson, and I am what's known as a psychic vampire, or energy vampire. Johnny and Haji find that the computer's last program was a simulation to test island security, and that the creature is still following those directives. That is, it aims at creating as much havoc as possible and will most likely try to gain access to the nuclear missiles. Quest phones Axton to inform him, but he ends up speaking with the computer's imitation of the general. This is another unnerving scene, not only because of the scary visuals but also the realization that since the creature has assimilated the commanding officer, now it has access to any location in the base. An evacuation of the island is called, and Team Quest tries to track the creature down, but instead, they themselves fall into a trap. The creature lures Dr. Quest into a room and assimilates him. Then it flees through a ventilation system. This sequence is possibly my favorite in this whole episode. I love how the creature replicates lungs and organs to approximate General Axton's voice. It's such a gross little detail. I'm all for it, even though it is inconsistent that the creature will never do this again. The creature heads for missile command through a ventilation system, resembling a xenomorph in this way. Team Quest rushes to stop it but soon discovers that the door to the main control room has been sealed shut. Inside, the creature begins missile launch with the target being Washington, D.C. What happens next is pretty confusing and quite rushed. Race, Johnny, and Haji find their way inside. They stun the monster with electricity, and Johnny connects to it via Quest World, transferring the personalities assimilated by the creature to disk. He finds the abort codes and cancels the nuke launch. Johnny then locks in combat with the monster in Quest World while Haji rearranges its DNA, causing it to lose its solidity and turn to mush. In the end, Haji successfully uses Quest World to restore the minds and personalities of the victims. Thus the body count in this gruesome episode equals zero. Now this is a pretty disappointing and confusing finale to an overall good episode. Now, on to the review proper. DNA Doomsday has some great thrilling moments, but honestly, I don't think it's one of Johnny Quest's better offerings. As mentioned before, I find the idea of this episode's monster being a biological computer unnecessarily overcomplicated. It reminds me of the many times when the old Scooby-Doo show featured a creature that was a ghost atop of being also a monster. scaring everybody in town? Look! The coffin is open and empty! Here lies Silas Long, half man and half wolf. Oh, swell! It ain't bad enough we're following a werewolf, now it looks like it's the ghost of a werewolf! Ghost? <laughs> it's just too many notes, as the classic says. After all, the creature is a shape-shifting blob that feeds on life force and leaves a DNA sludge behind itself. Why does it have to be a computer? Especially since Team Quest had already encountered aliens and monsters on several other occasions, so adding an additional one wouldn't break the world building. However, what really hurts the episode is that pretty early on, we are told that Team Quest will be able to revive all the victims. This lowers the stakes significantly. If it wasn't for the unlikely threat of a nuclear blast, there would be no stakes at all. This reminds me of the infamous episode of Extreme Ghostbusters that basically declawed the whole show in a similar way. Hey, yeah. Once we trap a ghost, its hold on people is broken, and usually things go back to the way they were. 
We also need to talk about Quest World. I have a troublesome relationship with it, and I've always had. I'm not talking about the horribly outdated CGI. I have a problem with how poorly defined the whole thing is. I don't understand its boundaries. I accepted Quest World the way it was initially introduced in the series second episode, as a hyper-advanced VR set. Basically the Matrix, but three years before the movie's premiere. Sure, it's a gimmick, but a harmless one. However, everything changes once you've turned Quest World into an all-powerful tool capable of reviving neurologically unresponsive people, swapping minds, and impregnating whales. What you've got then is a narrative-breaking deus ex machina that invites lazy writing. Unfortunately, the ending to DNA Doomsday, in my opinion, is rushed, confusing, and lazily written. I have no idea how Team Quest was able to save the day using Quest World, and rescue monsters every single victim. I will give the episode the benefit of the doubt by saying that the decision to make the creature non-lethal wasn't a cop-out but rather a trick that allowed a bit of tension building. As a result, we got to see members of Team Quest being eliminated one by one, with Haji being the last man standing. All in all, DNA Doomsday had the potential to be really scary and disturbing even, but it's not. On this level, it works more as a collection of clips than an episode. So when it comes to thrills, I'm willing to give it 3 cues out of 5. Now let's talk about the mystery. I think DNA Doomsday drops the ball a bit. John Carpenter's The Thing is a movie that oozes with paranoia. You have 12 men trapped in a remote location, being hunted by a shape-shifting monster. You never know who is who, who you can trust. Meanwhile, DNA Doomsday takes place in a locked military base on a remote island and features characters facing a shape-shifting monster. This is a great premise for a solid mystery, but the episode almost never embraces it, with the exception of that one time when the creature lures Dr. Quest into a trap. I wish we had more moments like this. Still, it is fun to see Team Quest being a step behind the enemy through the whole episode and being forced to work really hard to outsmart the creature. They have no idea what it will do next, who it will assimilate next, where it will go, or how to stop it. In the end, almost no physical fighting takes place here. It's purely a battle of wits. I enjoy that. Judging by what the episode actually is and not what it could have been, I will give it 4 cues out of 5. In the end, my rating is 3.5 cues out of 5. It's good, but definitely not in the top tier. The connection to the thing is interesting. Some of the visuals are positively gruesome, but the show has done much better in my opinion. That's all I got for you today. Do you remember watching DNA Doomsday back in the day? What did you think about the episode? Which one should I cover next? Please leave a comment consider liking the video, and subscribing to the channel. And join me for another, Quest for Quest. Until next time. Bye.